Last time on Dragon Ball Z, I made a video about why I believe blue Pikmin need a buff. I expressed concerns that Pikmin 4's new additions would make blues the most relevant they've ever been, which was a concern that most people seem to agree with. And at the end, I pitched my own idea of how blues could be buffed, which was very well received. Also discussed was how I believe blues have already been the most underwhelming in each game they've been in. And that was a bit that seems to have been the most controversial, almost overshadowing the point of the video itself. So I read your comments. They all f***ing sucked! <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There were some valid points made. And I thought it'd be fun to take an analytical approach solely focusing on the hierarchy of Pikmin types throughout the series, making a proper tier list by the end of it. Feels silly to mention this, but you know how YouTube comments can be. This tier list itself is entirely built on my own opinion. And while I think Purple Pikmin from 2 being the best of the best is pretty cut and dry, you're always gonna have that one guy that is like, NO! Feel free to disagree, but I will try my best to explain why I think the things I think. We'll be ranking each Pikmin type per game, since something like Purple Pikmin from Pikmin 2 are very different from Purple Pikmin from Pikmin 3. But in any case, Pikmin 1. Pikmin 1 easily has the most balanced assortment of Pikmin in the entire series. Although this might not be too much of a surprise, since the first game only features reds, yellows, and blues. Before my last video, I always heard people claim reds as the worst in Pikmin 1, which I disagree with. And although I expected that opinion to be the most contested, I was surprised to not only see people agree with me, but to even provide further points as to why they're not. Reds, in all games barring spin-offs, have a 1.5x strength multiplier. This aspect of reds is often overlooked, but if I have any big Pokemon fans watching, basically any one of them can tell you how much of a difference Stab makes, which is the same multiplier. 1.5x when you use a move type that corresponds to the active Pokemon, especially in Pikmin 1. No other type, since there are only two others, can contest that strength. The other perk of Reds is much better known, and that is their resistance to fire. Something a few of you pointed out that I completely forgot to mention is how insanely deadly fire is in Pikmin 1. To put things in perspective, for those who are most familiar with Pikmin 2 and 3, while in later games, fire takes 5 or 6 seconds to kill a Pikmin in each game respectively. In Pikmin 1, that time is less than a second and a half. And they scatter much more in the first game, so it's considerably harder to whistle all of them if a handful of your army gets caught in fire. Unlike Pikmin 2, fire geysers in Pikmin 1 cannot be destroyed, so trying to carry back many of the items in the forest navel without reds is a huge hassle. Even speedrunners, who exploit every last inch of the game and will typically not do something unless they 100% have to, still will use reds to carry things through fire not because they have to, but because they are well aware of how much of a pain in the ass it is trying to carry anything through fire without reds. All this being said, I'm putting reds at a respectable B. Not game changers, but they're pretty solid, and being the strongest Pikmin in the original game is pretty substantial. Yellows in Pikmin 1 are definitely the most slept on. Even as a kid, I was convinced this was the worst type by a wide margin. But pretty recently, after considering how useful bomb rocks are, my opinion on them has done a complete 180. That yellow Pikmin can be thrown higher and are the only type in the first game that can wield bombs. The bombs are what really define yellows in Pikmin 1. I like them because even when you don't need bombs, they're really handy to have, especially against the final boss. It's the hardest fight and was practically designed around the use of them. An argument I saw a few times was that yellows are bad because in most situations, you never need any more than like 15 of them on the field. But if anything, to me, that would be an argument as to why yellows are good. Yellows can hold bombs and bombs are so good that having Having as little as 15 yellow Pikmin is enough for most any situation. A commenter expressed that it's disingenuous to say people actively want to use bombs in Pikmin 1, and if that's how they feel about it, then fair enough, but I completely disagree. Although in my recent playthroughs I prioritized time over Pikmin lost, I mean I will willingly kill countless Pikmin if it means beating the game even a single day faster. But if I was more concerned about saving as many Pikmin as possible, I would make an effort to go out of my way to collect bombs way more often. Wally Logs, for example, even though they're complete pushovers in Pikmin 3. In the first two games, they can really f*** your team up. You can risk squashing nearly half your squad in a single hop, or you can throw two bombs at it and move on. Hell, even in my own playthroughs, if bombs were in more commonly accessible areas, I'd be using them all the time. That's how useful they can be. Plus, on top of the reinforced walls that bombs are required for, you can even use bombs on normal walls as well, which is a huge time saver. So again, I disagree that suggesting people actively want to use bombs in the original game is this a yellow Pikmin's throw height, on the other hand, isn't nearly as utilized.
utilize are helpful as it is in later games. It's used to get 3 out of 30 ship pieces, which wouldn't be a huge deal if there were a multitude of enemies designed around utilizing Yellow's store height, but there really isn't. The spider mini boss is the one enemy in the game where it really comes in handy. Those 3 up high ship pieces are what most people, including myself as a kid, think of when riding off Yellow's. But again, those bomb rocks are not only versatile, but because Yellow's are the only ones that can wield them, they're also the only Pikmin type that can take down reinforced walls. If we add the number of ship pieces that can't be carried back without tearing down a reinforced wall to the number of treasures that require a yellow Pikmin's throw height, yellows are required for 15 ship pieces, literally half the pieces in the game. I put a big ol' asterisk over all this though, because a lot of people will tell you that yellows are bad because, quote, you don't even need yellows if you use exploits. What they won't tell you is that you don't need any specific type of Pikmin to get any ship piece when using exploits. Yeah, Pikmin 1 is so jank that not even blues are needed for ship pieces in the water, so exclusively directing that argument to just yellows is being dishonest. Not to mention, most of these exploits are so tedious and time-consuming by even the pros that using something this meticulous to write off any pigment type is just, I mean, are you seeing this? You don't even need yellows, just do this instead. Yeah, okay. Not to mention, many of the easiest exploits are for ignoring pieces that require blue pigment. Blue pigment are so easy to ignore in the Forest of Hope specifically that basically anyone watching could pull these exploits off, none of which are time-consuming either. Yellows are B. But speaking of blues, they can go in water, and will also save drowning Pikmin in 1 and 2, which is cool, albeit rare, since you need to idle your Pikmin for it to happen. Blues are the least versatile Pikmin in the original game, as their usefulness boils down to, is there a thing in the water you haven't gotten yet? If the answer to that question is yes, then pull out blues. They are intended to help you grab 16 out of 30 ship pieces, which is a lot. However, unlike yellows, many of the exploits that let you ignore blues altogether are much easier to pull off, and 16 is a very generous number. I included things such as the Geiger counter as something intended for blues, even though if yellows and reds, you don't have to go in the water and can just do this. In fact, I'm pretty sure this is what I did even the first time I played Pikmin 1. In recent years, I've always hoped that blues would be given another trait or ability. I made a whole video about that after all. But that's because that outside of the things they are straight up required for, there's little other reason to use them. In my video about buffing blues, in defense of blues being useful even when they aren't required, many people brought up blues can bring things back to the ship faster than other colors since they could take shortcuts through water. This is a very valid argument for Pikmin 3. But in Pikmin 1 and 2, Pikmin are are super dumb, unless you use exploits. Once something is out of the water, even if that thing is being carried by all blues, Pikmin will never take that thing back into the water if there even exists a single potential path where it can be avoided, even if a route through the water would clearly be faster. Particularly in Pikmin 1, it can be infuriating how dumb Pikmin pathing is. Check out this ship piece, the massage machine, found in Distant Spring for example. This item is stuck here on the island surrounded by by water, so you obviously need to bring blues here. Ignoring a pretty simple exploit where you just have reds and yellows swim across the water, but that's beside the point. Once you have blues grab onto this, you would think they would just take it through the water as that would be the fastest route. But no! They carry it to this f***ing bridge and will wait there until the bridge is built. This would make sense if you had another color grab it, but why are the Pikmin that are designed to go in water? Making sure they don't have to go in water. Ignoring exploits. I can't think of a single situation in the first game where blue Pikmin are optimal, that isn't just a situation where they're required. The only thing that remotely comes to mind are those two puddles in a distant spring that are positioned around enemies. But even that's a bit of a stretch, since those are far enough that they can be avoided during combat pretty easily. From what I've seen, many people disregard all of this and simply focus on the fact that Pikmin 1 has a shit ton of water, and blues are the only Pikmin that can safely traverse that water. Therefore, blues are the best in Pikmin 1. And this is a conversation that we need to have, because whether you disagree with me or not, this is the disagreement that either leads to people wishing blues had more perks, or thinking they're one of the best Pikmin types in each game. This brings us to what I have dubbed the small key argument. <laughs> I assume we've all played Zelda, so let's say we're ranking every single item. And above the hookshot, above bombs, above the boomerang, above the bow, above everything. In S tier, I put the small key. And when you ask why, I tell you it's because in most all Zelda games, your progress will be gated, and the only thing that will allow you to proceed through the game is a small key. Bombs, arrows, the boomerang. Small keys have more instances where they are required for progression than any of those. You can't really argue a 
against that. I mean, it's factually true. But does that make them good? I don't think so. It makes them required. But to me, something good would be the hookshot. Stuns enemies, grabs items. Something that is at times required for progression. But even when they aren't, something like the hookshot is just good to have and use. If that example doesn't work for you, then here's another. I'm making a new Pikmin type. Goo Pikmin. Their ability is that they won't get stuck to deadly tape. That's their only ability. But in my hypothetical Pikmin game, I'm putting tape everywhere. It's like 50% of the map, and you can't get a lot of items without them, because I'm forcing you to use them. Does that make these Goo Pikmin good? Your answer to that question, I would assume, also coincides to what you think about Blue Pikmin. There's nothing wrong with Pikmin that have abilities that require them to be used. That's not what I'm saying at all. The problem is that if that's all they are, like Blues are, the decision of when you need to pull them out is already decided for you. Every Pikmin should have things they're required for, but in the case of Blue Pikmin, what happens when you've done everything that requires you to go in water? Well, then they're completely irrelevant. And to me, that's a problem. Because even when you don't need to carry things through fire, Red Pikmin are beneficial in nearly every combat situation since they're the strongest in the first game. That's what makes them good. This is more or less what was discussed in the last video, so I'll try not to dwell on it any further. Although I will say, in response to suggestions I saw a lot of people making, incorporating more things that force you to use blues like water caves or waterfalls doesn't buff blues as much as it nerfs every other Pikmin type. Since all you're doing is making more situations where you can't use other types without giving a reason to use blues outside those situations. Anyways, I promise I'll keep it more brief from here onward. If you think blues are the best in Pikmin 1, I wouldn't even regard that as a baseless opinion. People seemingly have very strong opinions on blue Pikmin, so I felt it necessary to elaborate on all of this, especially since I have similar opinions on blues in the next two titles. To me personally, the best Pikmin are those in which you want to use, not just tools the game requires you to use, even if the game requires you to use said tool a lot. That being said, I can't deny how much of Pikmin 1's design integrates water, so there's still a solid B. As far as where in B they land, in regards to whether they're before or after yellows, I was contemplating whether the large amount of water is enough to outrank the versatility of bombs, but personally, I don't think it does. <laughs> Let me just put it this way. If you could only have five Pikmin the whole game, weight requirements are not a factor. Between reds, yellows, and blues, yellows would be the clear choice. Fighting a bulborb with five blues? Not easy. Even if reds, that isn't easy. But five yellows? Well, at that rate, we're just talking about two bombs. So needless to say, because of bombs, yellows can get some work done even in small numbers. If bombs were basically like everywhere, I'd probably say yellows were the best in the original game. However, seeing as they aren't, I do still think reds are better than yellows since reds are the best Pikmin in nearly every combat situation and are more time efficient since you don't have to stock up on bombs. Regardless, all three types are solid. Again, Pikmin 1, in my opinion, has the most balanced selection of Pikmin out of any game. Moving on to Pikmin 2, let's get this out of the way. Purples, easy S. This is in no way a controversial opinion. Everyone knows how good they are in 2. Purples count as 10 Pikmin when carrying objects, have a 2x strength multiplier in the second game, and most notably, will bash and stun enemies when thrown, which allows you to do sh like this. To me, purples are the polar opposite of blues. Again, blues are Pikmin that are rarely more than what they're required for, whereas purples are almost entirely the Pikmin type you add to your party not because they're commonly needed, but simply because they're so good to just have in general. Seriously, only 3 out of 201 treasures, or I guess if you count the treasure you get for fighting the Water Wraith, require you to use purples. So if we were to exclusively judge a Pikmin's value by how many instances in the game require you to use them, purples would seemingly be one of the worst types but clearly Pikmin are more than just the things they're required for. It should also be noted that in Pikmin 2, a Pikmin's digging speed is tied to their strength multiplier, making purples the fastest diggers in the game. This also makes red Pikmin the second fastest diggers in Pikmin 2. Reds in Pikmin 2 are much the same as they are in the first game. 1.5x strength multiplier and resistant to fire. Fire is the most common hazard used by enemies and 2 by a slight margin, being used by 3 different enemies, 4 if you count the final boss. One of those enemies being the fiery Bulbalax, a Bulborb completely engulfed in flames. Reds are prime candidates to take this guy down, as they initially seem to be the only type that can take it down. Although, blues and purples can not also kill it. Blues, well, any type, technically, can kill it because bodies of water will douse its flames. This is hardly ideal, though, since the second that thing steps out of water, its flames reignite, confining you to a specific area in which it can be fought. Not to mention, blues have lower attack strength, so it's better to kill these things of reds regardless. As for purples, the damage they cause when thrown can also hurt a fiery bull blacks, although they will immediately 
immediately catch on fire, so keep that in mind. All that aside, a common argument is that purples invalidate reds in many ways because of their higher attack strength and slam ability. And this is a take I do mostly agree with. Although it should be noted that purples are much more rare than reds. Purples cannot be sprouted in the overworld and require you to convert a pre-existing Pikmin to purple to be made. Because of the Doomsday apparatus, a treasure that is 1000 Pikmin heavy, you need to be saving up as many purples as you can for the end of the game. In my most recent playthrough of Pikmin 2, I ended up using reds more than I did purples because I went into the game aware of the treasure's existence. To me, it's the Doomsday apparatus that still makes reds viable. Purples, as good as they are, are risky to use unless you want to blow a bunch of days grinding out purples. Being able to easily produce a 1.5x strength Pikmin whenever you want in the overworld is a pretty valuable facet of reds. Regardless, I can't overlook the overlap of reds and purples, so I still have to put them in C tier. <laughs> Since they were already mentioned, let's talk about blues in Pikmin 2. They're more or less the same as they were in the first game. Big difference this time being that there are less instances where they are seemingly intended to be used, relative to the game's longer runtime at least. In comparison to fire, there's no water equivalent to the fiery bull blacks. And likewise, there's no non-enemy water hazard equivalent to poison pipes, electric wires, or fire geysers. Not unless you count bodies of water themselves. Although, unlike fire or poison, drowning Pikmin stay completely in place until you whistle them, making them fairly easy to save. Plus, as I mentioned when talking about Pikmin 1, in most all situations, Pikmin will never try to carry things back through water, whereas they will try to carry things back through any other hazard. Not to mention, there are many points in which you can drain water in Pikmin 2, making blues completely irrelevant in that section once drained. There's just less reasons to use blues in Pikmin 2. So presumably, in response to that, I introduce you to the Submerged Castle, a cave that only blues can enter because the entrance is underwater. As if the game designers were sitting there like, how do we make blues seem better? I got it. Why don't we force the player to use them for an entire cave? I don't know, it feels cheap. Although, this brings us back to the small key argument brought up earlier. If to you, a Pikmin being required is what makes it good, then blues once again probably rank pretty highly for you. To me, a good Pikmin is more than just the things they're required for. So blues and Pikmin 2 are a C for me. <laughs> Yellows are pretty interesting in 2. Bomb Rocks, the most defining feature of Yellows in 1, have been removed. But in its place is the hazard Electricity, the most dangerous elemental hazard in the series since it will insta-kill Pikmin, except for Yellows. This also makes them the only Pikmin that can take down Electric Gates. There's a lot of exploits in Pikmin 2 that involve purples, but unless I'm mistaken, even with exploits, an Electric Gate cannot be taken down without Yellows. Enemies such as the Anode Weevil and the Anode Beetle can be defeated with any Pikmin, but considering how dangerous electricity is, it's pretty scary to fight either of those without yellows. Returning from one, however, is their ability to be thrown higher, which is still used to get some up high treasures, but is also much more utilized in combat than it was in one. Pikmin 2 has not one, not two, but three spider bosses with an elevated weak point. Four if you count the raging long legs. Although I don't because its abdomen is much lower to the ground. Of those three bosses, though, one of them is the final boss that uses electricity as an attack, once again, making yellows clutch during a Pikmin final boss. Pikmin 2's yellows aren't insane gods like Pikmin 2's purples, but they are easy A tier. <laughs> Lastly, we have Pikmin 2's whites, which are probably the most versatile Pikmin type in the entire series. They have the fastest movement speed, they will damage and often kill enemies if eaten. In fact, just one is enough to kill an entire creeping chrysanthemum. <laughs> They are resistant to poison, and are the only Pikmin that can find fully buried treasure. Again, since digging speed is tied to a Pikmin's damage multiplier in the second game, whites have the same dig speed as yellows and blues. 1x. If you're someone who bases a Pikmin's worth on how many things in the game require them, then you'll be delighted to hear that, in comparison to other types in 2, white Pikmin are required for the most amount of treasures in the game. Even using exploits, there is no way to obtain fully buried treasures without white Pikmin. That's 17 treasures that are fully buried, and however many more treasures should be counted because they're behind poison gates, which would actually include three caves as well. Much like purples, they cannot be sprouted in the overworld and instead require you to convert a pre-existing Pikmin, which you should basically always do since white Pikmin are pretty damn good in Pikmin 2. Maybe not S, but definitely A tier. White Pikmin don't do any one thing unbelievably well, but they do a lot of things. That's all five main Pikmin in the sequel. But of course, there's the meme itself, Boldman. Boldman only appear in 2, and are parasitic Pikmin that use a body 
body of a bulborb as its host. Dark, but I assure you that is quite literally what the game says. Darker is how you get them. You find them in caves following a larger bulbman, presumably its mother, in which you kill, and once you do, all the following bulbmen start screaming in panic until you whistle them to follow you instead. Although their goofy faces have turned them into quite the meme online, what's not a meme is that they are impervious to all four elemental hazards in Pikmin 2. Fire, poison, water, and even electricity. Other than that, its other attributes are average. Its movement speed, its digging speed, and attack strength are all default. Bulbmen are exceptionally helpful since, aside from the queen candy pop buds, they are the only way to get more Pikmin in caves. Their biggest drawback being that they cannot be taken out of a cave. The silver lining to that is that it makes them perfect candidates to be converted to any other Pikmin types, since those can be taken out of caves. They're S tier alongside purples. I would still argue that purples are the top of the top since they can do this. But Bulbmen are still incredibly helpful all the same, and I really hope they see a return in Pikmin 4. Finally, we have Pikmin 3. Last video, I only took the story mode into consideration, ignoring 3's iteration of purples and whites. But if we're gonna be thorough, we need to not only include them as part of this list, but also take into consideration how each type fares in all of Pikmin 3's modes. Reds are more or less the same as they were in Pikmin 2, once again resistant to fire and having a 1.5x damage multiplier. Since purples have been nerfed in 3, reds, alongside purples, have the highest standard damage multiplier in Pikmin 3. I say standard because... Well, we'll talk about Rock Boys in a bit. Fire isn't as lethal as the first game, but fire geysers cannot be destroyed like they can in the second. In fact, you can't even see the sprouts of fire will come out of in the third game. You just have to remember where they're gonna shoot from, and geysers themselves are a pretty dangerous hazard in versus mode. The map that comes to mind is a Rusted Labyrinth, where there will be multiple walls of fire geysers that are a nightmare trying to carry items through without reds. Again, like in previous entries, if Pikmin are blocked by a body of water, they will either stop whatever they're carrying, or just take another route altogether. They will will not stop for fire, meaning that if you leave yellows to carry something back instead of reds, and there's fire geysers on the route back, don't expect them to actually make it back safely of said item. Pikmin 3 also introduces the pyroclasmic sluch, which will slide around leaving a trail of fire behind it. Pretty dangerous enemies, but reds can make very short work of them. These things can be killed with a rock Pikmin's impact, albeit very inefficiently since it takes longer and you can risk burning them to death. In terms of combat, reds aren't as unique as they were in the first game since rock Pikmin exists, but there isn't as much overlap with rocks and reds as there is with purples and reds. Let's slide these guys into a low B and, th and then let me tell you what I mean by that. Rock Pikmin, new to 3, more or less replace purples as their strength comes from the damage they inflict on impact of being thrown. In fact, they cannot grab enemies at all. Purples and 2 were similar with their impact, but rocks are a lot messier since after one hits an enemy, they will roll back and just idle there for like a hot minute basically asking to be killed. This is on top of the fact that rock Pikmin will inevitably end up everywhere when you use them the fight, let alone the fact that they can't latch on the enemies as a pretty big setback in certain scenarios. The bug-eyed Cromad comes to mind as an enemy I would rather fight with reds since it can't be charged from the sides. Speaking of charging, reds are better when charged since even though a thrown rock pikmin deals a large amount of damage, a charged rock pikmin will only deal 10 damage, equivalent to a 1x multiplier on a standard attack, and then roll way back, making them a horrible choice of pikmin to charge with since they won't grab onto the enemy. Basically rock pikmin are really bad at consecutive attacks. Don't get me wrong. Rock Pikmin are overall the best Pikmin they use in combat in Pikmin 3. I just want to illustrate the point that the way in which you fight with them is much different than other Pikmin, for better and worse. They are also immune to being stabbed or crushed, which while isn't as big of a deal in 3 as it would be in 1 or 2, it's still immensely helpful, most notably against that rock item in Versus. It's not mentioned in game, but they are tied with yellows as the fastest diggers in 3, very useful during missions. Their last case use would be to break crystals, primarily crystal walls that require the use of a bomb or are rock pikmin. While rock pikmin are great for most combat situations, they are terrible for just about everything else. Targeting things, trying to carry stuff back, they're always tumbling and rolling around which makes them near impossible to multitask with. If there's a strawberry trapped in a crystal for instance, you can't just leave three rock pikmin there. The amount of pikmin required to carry a strawberry, and expect them to carry it back when they break it out, because they won't. Once they break that strawberry out of the crystal, they'll just stand 10 miles away from it like idiots doing nothing. This applies to everything mind you. If you 
throw a rock pigment to grab a pellet, a lot of times it will break the pellet down, but then not even grab the pellet it got down since it will be too far. Rocks are the worst at versus mode since due to their rolling, they suck at fighting other pigmen, because they won't land on the spot you try to throw them to. They will instead roll beyond the spot you throw them. That aspect makes them terrible at stopping an item being carried by an opponent's pigmen, and will sometimes lead to your rocks helping your opponent carry the item back. In a game all about time efficiency, having to spend extra time trying to get rock pigmen to do the thing you want them to do is a decent strike against them. Not enough to make them bad. They're still very good, and I'd argue even better than reds. But it's not enough to invalidate reds completely. The TLDR is that when it comes to multitasking, you don't need to babysit reds in the same way you need to babysit rock boys. Again, rocks aren't a replacement for reds in the same way you can easily argue that purples are a replacement for reds in Pikmin 2. A tier. Better than Pikmin 2's whites, but not quite as good as yellows from 2. But how about yellows from 3? Well, as mentioned earlier, they are the fastest diggers in 3 alongside rock Pikmin. Otherwise, their ability to be thrown higher and immunity to electricity returns from previous entries. Electricity as a hazard is a gigantic joke in Pikmin 3. All it does now is stun Pikmin until whistled. I understand maybe nerfing it so it isn't an instant kill, but making it so it doesn't kill at all? At the very least, it makes yellow Pikmin less valuable than they were in 2, at least in terms of security from hazards. In terms of combat, however, yellow Pikmin are probably the best they've ever been. In Pikmin 1 and 2, being able to throw Pikmin higher means just that. Yellow Pikmin see more verticality when thrown, but because of the pointer controls and most notably the lock-on feature of 3, yellows are not only the Pikmin you can throw at high targets, but now far targets. Being able to target an enemy and essentially move wherever you want without the concern of being out of range is an invaluable feature. There's a bit of overlap with a new winged Pikmin that can simply fly to a target, but winged Pikmin only have half the strength of a yellow, still giving yellows a lot of value in combat. Plus, in terms of gathering, yellow Pikmin having a throw arc makes collecting up high treasures much easier to grab than with pinks, where you have to do this like back up and target charge bullshit that is really finicky. I mean, are you seeing this? They are not the only Pikmin that can carry bombs this time around, but they are the only Pikmin that can take down electric gates, which are the only walls that cannot be destroyed by bombs. Unless you count the bamboo gates, of course, but bamboo gates can't be destroyed, period. High B. <laughs> Since I mentioned them, pink slash winged Pikmin. Introduced in 3 alongside rock Pikmin, winged Pikmin can, well, fly, which is really, really good. Since pinks will only touch the ground under rare circumstances, such as when drinking nectar, their flight allows them to simply fly over many dangerous enemies positioned on the ground, alongside also being able to just fly over water and even grab items out of the water as long as they aren't completely submerged, which I'll expand on later when talking about blues, but needless to say, they're pretty good. Their fly also arguably makes them the best Pikmin in the game to carry back objects. You usually don't have to worry about enemies that might be on their way back since said enemies will usually be out of reach on the ground, and being able to take shortcuts not only over water, but over inclines and walls. Like god damn, winged Pikmin are great for scavenging. The only enemy that's really a concern to them and not other Pikmin is that stupid spider in the web. Freaking hate that thing. There are also certain obstacles like the clipboards and the previously mentioned bamboo gates only winged Pikmin can interact with. A weak point for them is combat. Eh, kind of. They have a 0.5x strength multiplier, which is the lowest strength a Pikmin can have. It makes them bad choices for grounded enemies. Although, despite their weaker attacks, they are ideal for flying enemies since they can always just directly fly to said enemy. I want to address this because apparently, there's a rumor that flying Pikmin cause more damage to flying enemies, but this has zero basis as it is completely untrue. Granted, they can kill flying enemies very fast since unlike other Pikmin, they can be charged at flying enemies. However, their damage multiplier is 0.5x no matter what they're attacking. They're also the best choice to kill enemies above water for the same reason. I made this comparison in the last video, but you can either try to throw your blues onto a moving skeeter's gate, or just do this with pinks. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether to put them at high A or low S, although given their weaknesses, like having the lowest attack strength and the slowest digging speed, I think high A is fair. <laughs> Alright, let's talk about blues. If you couldn't already gather from the winged Pikmin breakdown, blue Pikmin are the most invalidated in 3 than they've ever been before. I mean, when pinks are the best choice to carry back objects across water, fight enemies over water, and can still grab items in the water as long as it isn't submerged, then yeah. The only reason to ever use blues now is for the handful of things that are completely submerged in water. Blues can also no longer save drowning Pikmin like they could in 1 or 2, making them pretty niche in Pikmin 3, all things considered. A Pikmin covering a similar area of expertise doesn't inherently make 
make another Pikmin bad. I mean, there's slight overlap of reds and rocks are pinks and yellows. Although, it's a point of contention with blues, because whereas all four of those previously mentioned Pikmin have their own case uses that are uniquely their own, winged Pikmin have overlap of a blue Pikmin's only ability. There are two bosses that use water as a hazard during their fight, the Quaggle Mireclops and the Plasm Wraith. The irony of both those fights being that blues are just as valuable as one or more other types. The Plasm Wraith is a boss that uses fire, water, electricity, and crushing attacks, making use of reds, blues, yellows, and rocks respectively. However, it also floats, making use of pinks. And as for the Quaggled Mireclops, it leaves puddles of water wherever it moves from, seemingly making blues the best choice. That being said, it's never been hard to rescue drowning Pikmin, and 3 makes it the easiest it's ever been. You don't even need to whistle them in 3. They'll often save themselves. Plus, you need Rock Pikmin in this fight to break its crystal, and reds can deal the most damage, even more than rocks in this scenario, after that crystal is shattered. In fact, even in boss rush mode, the devs deliberately give you reds for this fight. If there was any boss in 3 where blues would blatantly be the best choice, it would be the Mireclops. But considering the advantages and requirements of other Pikmin, and how much of a non-threat water is in 3, I don't think they are. I didn't even mention pinks that can fly over that water, and then can be charged instead of thrown at its weak points. As far as the other modes are concerned, there's a mission in the Formidable Oak where having blues is so pointless due to the small amount of water. The mission is literally designed around converting your blues to reds and rocks as soon as possible. And then for versus mode, there are 3 out of 12 maps that incorporate water into its design. However, only one of the maps, Stagnant Sea, really utilizes blues to any meaningful degree, since basically half the map is water. Parch Brook has like two small puddles, and then in Buried Pond, blues are outclassed by pinks who can grab items in and navigate said pond more efficiently than blues. Because of pinks in 3, the only remaining defense for blues would once again return us to the small key argument. Instead of reiterating on the same arguments for blues twice, I'm just gonna put them in D tier. I really hope they get some additional perks in Pikmin 4. As bad as Pikmin in D tier seems, they are not the worst Pikmin in Pikmin 3. Because if we're counting extra modes, the worst Pikmin in Pikmin 3 has got to be the whites. Where do I even start with these guys? First of all, two of their abilities from the last game are just absent. The resistance to poison isn't applicable because Pikmin 3 doesn't have poison. Likewise, Pikmin 3 has no items that are completely hidden underground. Well, since digging out hidden treasures was their whole thing in 2, surely they're at least decent diggers in 3, right? No, they're the worst diggers in the game alongside pinks. But at least pinks can fly. Speaking of pinks, if you thought they invalidated blues in 3, whites have it much worse. Because sure, white Pikmin are still the fastest Pikmin, but that hardly means anything since they can't take shortcuts through water like blues, can't take shortcuts through terrain like pinks, and are slower than they were in Pikmin 2 anyway. And for whatever reason, they're also as weak as pinks from Pikmin 3, whereas they had a standard attack strength in Pikmin 2. It's a mere 0.5x multiplier with no flight to compensate here, objectively making them the worst Pikmin for combat in this game. Well, what about their ability to damage enemies when ingested? In Pikmin 2, if a Bulborb ate a single white, it would immediately die. In Pikmin 3, that same enemy now needs to eat 5 to be killed by a white Pikmin's poison. This was slightly buffed in Pikmin 3 Deluxe, needing to ingest 5 whites to 3, although still having to give up 3 Pikmin to kill a red Bulborb, which is a very easy enemy to kill in Pikmin 3 specifically, is still pretty terrible. Also, information on their poison buff from 3 to Deluxe is not documented anywhere to my knowledge. Not even the wiki. But you are looking at video evidence of that being the case, so I assure you I'm not making this up. Since they're not in the story, you're not really given a choice on when you get to use white Pikmin, which makes them a bit better, as they're generally supplied in stages that not only take advantage of their abilities, but also intentionally do not have pinks. A lot of people focus on how bad purples got nerfed in 3. However, for my money, whites got hit way harder. In Pikmin 3, whites are essentially a flying Pikmin that can't fly, with all the weaknesses of one without the compensation of flight. Low D. Worst Pikmin in the series. Last and uh, not exactly least, is Pikmin 3's purples. If they screwed over white Pikmin so hard, then what do they do to purples? Well, the most notable nerf is that they no longer stun enemies, like at all. They still can't be thrown as far, and still pound downwards halfway through their arc, which basically just makes them worse reds since, at the very least, they have a 1.5x strength multiplier. It's not their original 2x, but 1.5x makes them stronger than average. One of the things that has always bothered me most about purples and 3 is that they can't instantly weigh down flying enemies. Removing their damage impact is bad enough, but are you telling me despite their appearance, they aren't even heavy anymore? Fortunately, they're still decent diggers, sharing a 1.5x digging speed alongside reds. And of course, their trait of counting as 10 Pikmin when carrying objects returns. This ability is immensely useful in the timed mission mode, and sure enough, the mission mode is where they are most prominent in 3. I commonly hear the opinion that 
purples from 3 are the worst pigment type, but especially in the face of whites from 3. I strongly disagree. Purples seem so sh** in 3 because instead of focusing on what they are, people focus on what they lost. Which, don't get me wrong, is a lot. Too much if you ask me. But they still have above average strength, they have above average digging speed, and count as 10 Pikmin when carrying back objects. And in Pikmin 3, most fruits are between 5 and 10 weights, meaning you can throw a single purple on that big ol' apple in mission mode, and then just move right along. In Pikmin 3, purples are essentially reds except they traded their better throw arc, speed, and fire resistance for the ability to count as 10 Pikmin on an object. Not exactly the best trade, but not what I consider D tier either. I'm putting them at a low C. They're pretty useful for carrying back objects in mission mode where you're multitasking like crazy, albeit much less useful in the few versus maps they appear in. That being said, that's the list. Hopefully I won't regret these rankings later, but I thought pretty long and hard about each Pikmin's placement, and for the time being, I'm feeling pretty good about this list. You know the drill though. Make sure you let me know how wrong this list is in the comments below. I would assume for most people, the biggest change made to this list would be the placement on the blues. Regardless, I'd still be curious to hear what people's thoughts were in general. I'm already foreseeing a screenshot of this list being posted elsewhere, and people going, what the f*** is this sh**? having zero context to why I ranked everything like this. If that does happen, someone please clip this in response. Also, someone humor me and make a ranking on the Pikmin and Hey Pikmin, cause I'll be damned if I'm putting them on the same list of Pikmin 1 through 3's Pikmin. I'm most likely done with Pikmin content for now, but it was fun to make two of these videos in a row since Pikmin is one of my all-time favorite franchises, and I've barely even mentioned it on the channel. Either way, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later. See ya! Hey there, these videos are supported by patrons such as Albion, Penchester, Some Crazy Idiot, Ian, David Marchese, Awesome Games, Gameplayer1500, Kinzel TN, Drew Kellenberger, David Bucheco, Jeffrey P. Long, Pretoria Mars, Amanda Guth, and Rami Batter. Thank you so much for your support, thank you for watching, until next time, have a good one.